First, I'd, I'd like to start by thanking everybody from whatever part of the world you're joining us from for attending um, and having an interest in, in, in letting me be your presenter today. Um, as Hernan said, my name is Jeff Bonkowski. I'm the Western Area Manager for Hazardous Control Technologies. Um, originally, I was a career firefighter um, up by the Michigan and the Detroit area where I served 27 years and in my course of my career, I learned as much as I could about hazardous materials and um, basically the, the high hazard fires that firefighters are faced with on a daily basis. Uh, I retired and started doing consulting work and through that consulting work with the ethanol industry and looking for a solution and dealing with these high hazard fires, um, it, led me to hazard control technologies and through that i started uh, doing some training and working with hazard controls and um i can say i hope to share some of that knowledge that i've developed through the years and helping you have a better understanding of encapsulator agents and the benefits and and uh, the protections it brings um, not only to the environment but to uh, workers and, and and the environment to get a better understanding, we need to understand the, uh, the versatility of an encapsulator agent and how it's able to protect so many different hazards and making fighting some of these industrial fires, as I said earlier, easier. Um, and, and when I was doing a lot of my trainings, you know, fire chiefs would ask me if I was in charge of a fire, how I would handle it. And in most cases, it was let it burn. And you know what, I'm going to point that out as we go through. As we talk about the petrochemical solutions, I'm gonna talk about the fire suppression and vapor controls. Um, again, I'm gonna point out as we go through here, when it talks about the vapor control and you look at some of the other agents that have, are available to us currently in the fire service or in industry, what do we have out there that can deal with vapor control? and then spill control and degassing and cleaning tanks. So first off, as I said, you know, when we sit there and we start looking at some of these fires, I mean, we read and see them in the news um, and, you know, they, they happen and, you know, currently with the increased demand and, you know, the, the high prices, um, if an incident like this were to occur in a refinery today, um, it would even drive the prices of gasoline even higher. Uh, because of the demand and being able to try to meet demand with, again, fewer refineries being able to um, produce the gasoline needed. So when I have sat there and, you know, I've watched news reports and I've, I've um, seen different articles with chiefs and so on, uh, as I mentioned with my um, responses to many fire chiefs and let it burn, that's the same thing that many because of the hazards that these fires pose. When we sit there, we start looking at, you know, the amounts of water that are needed, um, the environmental pollution that could be. But again, one of the things we need to take into account, if we let it burn, look at the black smoke. What's going on downwind? What kind of fallouts being created by that smoke and the toxins and the soot? I said earlier, water, you know, we need, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of water a minute. And in many cases, water supply becomes an issue. So, I mean, we need to run all kinds of large diameter hose. Um, and again, it becomes a, a nightmare in trying to uh, be able to get around and be able to use and get that, um, those quantities of water in place. And when we do, we sit there and we start using and we start looking at, you know, our current fluorinated foams, you know, we're, we're looking at the environmental issues, those forever chemicals, the health issues, you know, cancer and firefighters and, and people that might be exposed to it. But then again, if containment areas are not able to hold it, the runoff in the streams, ponds, in the environment, you know, our oceans, our, our lakes and our streams. So there's many hazards when we sit there and we start looking at these types of fires and these types of incidents that we have to take into account. So through the presentation, I hope to give you a better understanding of the difference between and how an encapsulator works differently than foam, 
how we will need much less water, how we can work together with foam, um, that we're not trying to replace foam. We discussed the proper applications and, and how it's best suited and identify the hazards where uh, you know, your encapsulated agents can be used. But in order to, to do that, we first need to have a better understanding of just what an encapsulator agent is. And if we go into our NFPA 18A, our standard on water adders for fire control and vapor mitigation, which is the standard for an encapsulator agent, we'll see that it lists it's effective on all classes of fires, class A, class B, class D, uh, lithium ion batteries, which is you know, becoming a, a huge issue with not only industry, but also with the fire service. It works on uh, hydrocarbons as well as polar solvents and where foams don't work on the three dimensional fires, spraying, uh, liquid fuel fires. But again, I mentioned earlier, the vapor. Okay, can anybody name me a fire control agent that works on vapors that will prevent a vapor explosion or prevent a vapor fire from even happening? And well, I hope to give you a better understanding of just how an encapsulator agent can do that. And to do that, we look at the NFPA 18A section 77, which is the spherical micelle stability test. And what this test does is it tests the ability of a spherical micelle to encapsulate a flammable liquid, both polar or nonpolar or hydrocarbons, um, class A or B. It is a test to make sure that in the presence of high heat, once we've encapsulated those fuels or vapors, we will not allow those to burn again. Um, there's a, a one minute test. Once, this, uh, once the fuel is encapsulated, um, we apply heat to the surface and we can have no visible flames. And then it sits for two hours. And at the end of two hours, again, there can be no flames. And we start looking at the foam test, the burn back test, that's, that's a 15 minute test to test foam for burn back resistance. Where here an encapsulator agent will go for two hours. And I will say that it will go longer. Um, you can go two months and you can actually go until that pan has evaporated off and at no time through that process um, will it become a flammable mixture again. So the basic building block, as I've stated in that, te in that test of spherical micelle, the basic building block of an encapsulator agent are the spherical micelles. And to give you a better understanding of how they are able to work on, as mentioned, both polar and nonpolar and hydrocarbons, liquids and or vapors, um, we need to understand a little bit more about the molecule. And the best way to give you a, an understanding of the molecule is to play this you know, short little video and I'm gonna stop it as we go through. But as we see, the basic building block is that spherical micelle. And part of that is our molecule and the understanding the molecule. Our molecule has a polar head, which loves water and a nonpolar tail that fears water. It's nothing to do with water. We'll do everything it can to avoid it. So as the concentrate starts going up into the, um, into the water stream, once those molecules get into the water stream, they create these spherical micelles. Those tails are doing everything they can to get out of the water. They want nothing to do. So they make these tight, tight spherical micelles. All the tails are tucked inside and all those polar heads are on the outside, making these chemical cocoons, as we call them. And as they sit there and they start going through the water stream, they start coming out either through a fixed system or a fire nozzle or fire hose, um, whatever way we're trying to um, get that applied to the surface, all of those molecules on the outer surface that have made up those spherical micelles, the ones closest to the surface, now they, those spherical micelles break apart and those, those nonpolar tails, they expose themselves. So what we've now done is we've put a skin on the surface of each and every water droplet which is important because now we're not using just plain water. But yet, even though we've put in all those, those micelles or all those molecules on the outer surface have sat there and they've broken open inside of each and every water droplet, there are still millions and millions of these spherical micelles. 
And this is where our encapsulation of those vapors, of those gases takes place. Those chemical cocoons that are basically hollow will sit there and they will absorb or they will hold those flammable vapors and liquids inside so that now they're basically surrounded by water. And again, through the evaporation process of these water molecules and these water droplets, we will never reach a flammable limit or flammable range again. Encapsulator. So as we go through, let's start looking at the, the fire suppression. Um, and as I start showing and we start discussing, we'll show class A, your class B. When we talk about class B, there's the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional. And, and I know in many cases, people, well, what's a three-dimensional fire? Well, to give you a better understanding. Uh, as we go through this next few slides, I will point out just uh, and help you have a better understanding of what the three-dimensional fires are. But some of the safety issues when we're sitting there and we're looking at an encapsulator agent versus water or other extinguishing agents is that when we use water, we create steam, superheated steam in some cases. Yet, when we sit there and we use an encapsulator agent, there's no steam. Encapsulator agents, because we are able, again, with those chemical cocoons, those spherical micelles inside of each and every water droplet, we help reduce the smoke by 68%, which improves visibility. We start taking those toxins out of this foot. So when we sit there and start looking at those downwind um, events, you know, where we have those huge clouds um, and we have things taking place, we're able to have an, an effect on those by reducing the toxins by up to 98.6%, which is huge when you sit there and start looking at people that might have uh, respiratory problems or cancers or, or other types of conditions. Okay, we can help reduce the effects. Okay. And again, what is the number one cause of reignitions when we sit there and start looking at some of these large fires? Okay, we have issues with these tanks made of steel holding large amounts of heat. And even though we're using other agents, okay, those other agents start to break down. The fuel's again exposed now to the high heat of the steel on the tanks, and we have reignition. So we'll talk about how we're able to work with um, the other agents to be able to rapidly cool those surfaces. Okay, and if we can rapidly cool those surfaces, we're able then to protect and uh, prevent reignitions. And we again, as I mentioned, we could be used in combination work with other agents. We can work on those three-dimensional fires, those distillation columns. How about valves or manifolds? Uh, recently, you know, probably about three, four years ago, uh, one of the last uh, largest tank farm fires that we had here in, in the U.S. was was caused by a manifold fire, um, which, again, could have easily been extinguished and, and prevented uh, 11 of 15 storage tanks from burning down. We can stop that rapid spread of heat. We'll, we'll see some videos as we go through. And then, you know, we've been proven in energized of, of environments. For instance, your transformers, where, you know, a transformer has failed and you have a class B fire in a class C environment. And we're going to see that in this video. Gives us a better understanding of all of the effects and all of the hazards that encapsulator agent F500 works on. And to start with, you know, quick introductory video. And it starts with your class A fire. You know, here we see a couple stacks of pallets. The pallets on the left have been pre-treated. As you can see, even though they were exposed to high heat by the pallets burning, um, there was no um, fire spread. We look at these tires, okay? Again, black smoke turning white. I talked about the ability of the encapsulator agent to have an effect on that black smoke, the soot, the toxins. Well, here, we still have lots of fire, a lot of heat. Where's the smoke? Where's the smoke? The smoke is beginning to disappear. Okay, and now we see that what looks like steam, but it's not, it's a warm white mist. We look at an automobile fire, a car fire. One of the things they're using a, a TKO nozzle, a turbo knockdown nozzle that HCT has. Um, it's a 20 gallon per minute nozzle. See how little runoff. 
here we have a uh, firefighters approaching and, and fighting a, 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 a two-dimensional fire, a pit fire. Here's an alcohol fire. And as you can see, there's no foam. You see a, a, a white froth or like a white discoloration in the water, but there's no foam. But now here is a three-dimensional fire. Okay, we have a fire that's spraying down into a backup of a jet engine cowling. And in a short period of time, he's able to do two things. He's able to encapsulate and it cool the metal, encapsulate the fuels and extinguish that fire rapidly. In class C environments, energy storage systems, lithium ion batteries. Now we continue to hear how with lithium ion batteries are so difficult to put out that we need copious amounts of water. What's a copious amount? Um, when we sit there and we start looking at class D, much of our cars, many applications for class D metals. Um, a normal car is somewhere in the area of about uh, 350 pounds of class D metals. But again, let's think back to that video of the uh, spherical micelle. Okay. The transformers. The transformer has failed. It's now a class B fire in a class C environment. But when we get back and start thinking about that class D metal, and I, I, I mentioned, let's look and think about that video where I showed it with the spherical micelles and how they're formed and how they're created. We put that skin on the surface of the water droplet. So it's no longer truly water that's coming in contact with that class D metal. It's now a water droplet that's got a encapsulator skin over the surface of it. So what happens is those tails act like a heat sink and help absorb the heat into and force it into the water molecule where all of those cocoons inside the water droplet they will rapidly absorb that heat and then slowly release it into the water and through that process again there is no steam that's created or generated so as we go on i'm gonna yeah it's gonna get ready to play i want to show a, a video here um this is a, some tests that was done in china and it was a comparison uh, between F500 encapsulator agent and foam. I want to show this video because it gives you a really, really good understanding on the difference in one application and to the amount of product that's being needed or is needed to be able to deal with these. So we're looking at a tank that has 574 gallons of diesel in it. They're using one monitor with 570 gallons per minute. And as I show this, I wanna point out a few things because many people that are used to using foam and have no knowledge of an encapsulator agent, when they start using an encapsulator agent, they're going to continue to use it like you would foam. And I wanna point out that to the left, bottom left, that hose stream that's being applied to the side of the tank. That's foam, that's a foam technique. They're trying to cool the sidewall of that steel tank so that the foam can get a footprint and start to spread across the surface. So here we have, again, one nozzle. We're flowing 570 gallons per minute. And then 58 seconds, they were able to extinguish this fire. 552 gallons of solution, 16 and a half gallons of concentrate. Pretty good. So as they, as, they, as they go through, as they go through now, we're going to sit there and we're going to look at the same tank, the same amount of fuel with an AFFF foam. But this time, we're going to use two nozzles. We're going to use twice the flow. Again, bottom, you see that hose stream being applied to the side of the tank, trying to cool it. Trying to see, you see that one stream, it's shooting over the, over the top a little bit. But again, he's, he's trying to bank it in. He's just a little too high. Um, now the one nozzle that's coming down is also trying to cool the sidewall of the tank. So we've got, instead of one, we now have two nozzles on the, on the sidewall of this tank, as well as one of the foam nozzles trying to cool the tank so that they can get it cool enough so that the foam can start to get a footprint and then spread across the surface of the tank. Otherwise, the surface of the tank is just going to cause the, the bubbles to evaporate and uh, be useless. So with the two mon not, not monitors, again, we're flowing 1140 or twice, twice the water. 
And uh, you'll see, I believe in, in a minute or two, you will see a little puff of uh, like a dry powder type of extinguishing agent come into effect here too. Things that we are taught, um, as you can see it coming in right here, um, again, these are these are tech, techniques and these are, are things that we learn um, when we take classes and we learn about applying and applications of foam. So we're using all of the tools in the toolbox on this application trying to um, extinguish. We're trying to cool the tank. We're trying to get, you know, that foam to create a, and establish a footprint so we can have it begin to uh, go across, spread across the surface and extinguish this, this, this particular fire. So as we go through, uh, I, I will mention, you know, the time that the F500 was 58 seconds. And as we go through, um, we're going to see that this is far beyond the 58 seconds. And unfortunately my video won't let me advance. So I apologize for the but we'll see the difficulties in trying to work with and extinguish um, this fire using the current methods that, uh, that are available to us. So as we go and we continue, you know, the extinguishment time is seven minutes and 35 seconds. And we went from a solution amount of 535 gallons to 8,655 gallons. We went from a concentrate amount of 16 and a half gallons to 260 gallons. So when we sit there and start looking at the cost, um, especially as we sit there and we start looking now at some of the new technology, some of the green foams that they're coming up with. Okay, if we look at some of the green foams that they're coming out with, we need to understand that in many applications, those green foams are going to require three to five times more application. So if we're already using, you know, eight, 9,000 gallons, multiply that by three. That's the amount, you know, of, of concentrate that you're going to need. So if you're using you know, 300 gallons, you know, you could be using, you know, three times that, five times that, um, 900 to, you know, or more gallons of concentrate to put out that same fire. But yet, it was only 16 and a half gallons of F500 concentrate that was used. I mean, let's let's think about these cost savings, the differences, and we're, we'll talk even more about some of the cost savings. So when we look at how to use it, I'm gonna go over and, and, and show a couple of things and, and hopefully we'll see. Um, uh, Still hear me? Okay, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to show this video. And what this video is going to show is it's actually a video um, of an incident that occurred in the refinery. There was an explosion, and this explosion sat there and had some metal fly and puncture a hole in the side of an asphalt tank. It was hot asphalt. Ooh. Hot asphalt kind of came out and all the vapors that were being released was spread across um, because again it is hot you're going to have more vapors being released and found an ignition source and it created a fire in and around the storage tanks um, then it continued to spread into the refinery area where it again found an ignition source and began to uh, create a fire and a hazardous solution situation so we see here the encapsulated agents can be used to, to help reduce the heat. Okay, well, I can take it back a step farther. Let's go back to the initial explosion. Okay, if there was a vapor that caused the explosion and there were monitors that were monitoring those vapors, okay, a system could have been activated which could have prevented the explosion from even occurring, which then would have prevented that tank from being ruptured. But what they did in this particular event in this scenario is they were using water um, to attack because it was a three-dimensional fire 
somewhat ineffective. Where with F500, we've talked about how effective F500 can be on that three-dimensional fire and how effective it can be. So what they're doing is they're, they're using all of this water, trying to cool, and they're using it to try to uh, push and try to corral some of that asphalt into uh, an area, as you can see where the circle is, of that storage tank farm, where they could then try to, once they direct all that hot asphalt um, that's burning into that one area, then um, they can hopefully get some uh, foam on it uh, and get it extinguished. In this case, foam can be effective because we're dealing with a two-dimensional fire. Um, when you sit there and look at you know, other storage tanks and other things that might be, become involved, um, a 500 encapsulated rage could be a, of great benefit in being able to um, cool those storage tanks. The other thing is when we first saw that leak occurring, Okay, because of the ability of encapsulator agent F500 to rapidly cool, um, we could have helped reduce that spread. We could have helped rapidly cool that tar, that asphalt. Um, we could have helped reduce those vapors being emitted because we know that the higher the temperatures of products, the more they off gas, more vapors come off. So there's many number of things that could have been a very, very effective in being able to have an effect in dealing with this type of an emergency. So when we sit there and we look at all the different, you know, things that could have happened and how it could have made a change, okay, in this next video, I hope to give you a better idea of just how the agent F500 could have been effective. If we look at these storage tanks, and again, you know, here it is in combination with using a foam product. I mentioned a bit ago, the tank farm fire in, in the United States that started with a manifold. Okay, it ended up from a manifold to 11 of 15 storage tanks burning to the ground. And here we see, you know, a, a presentation showing F500 a system along with a, maybe a foam system. And you'll see the F500 systems are based around the storage tanks with the bladder tank system or water-driven proportioner. And what will happen is if one tank were to have an incident, okay, we could begin using this system to cool the outer shell of other tanks to prevent those exposures from becoming involved in the fire. If we work in conjunction, we saw in the previous videos done in China where they were sitting there, they were using those water spray monitors to cool the sides of the storage tank so they could get a footprint and trying to get the foam to be able to extinguish the fire and smother it. Okay, here we have a foam chamber. We have a foam system in conjunction with the F500. F500 can be used to cool the side walls of the storage tank, okay, in the event of a fire. While the foam, chambers then or the foam system is can be activated and it can do exactly what it's designed to do. It can sit there and it can start putting that foam blanket on the surface of the uh, top of the tank. You know, and here's you know, an example, you know, here's a lightning strike. Um, they've got a heat detector that has been activated. Um, we've got the F500 system, which is going to then uh, be activated. It's going to start cooling the side walls of that tank helping that foam system now as you see those the foam starting to come in through those foam chambers helping it to create that footprint it needs helping it to get and spread across the surface of the tank and smother the fire stopping it from being able to propagate to other tanks so there's many ways we can assist in helping in dealing with these types of fires some of the other hazards when we sat there and we started looking at you know, the water supply, I brought the water supply issue up and you know, we're using thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of water. Well, what does, what do petroleum products do? You know, they float on the surface of the water. So if we're sitting there and we're using large quantities of water and trying to put these tanks out, we start to keep you know filling them in, filling them in, and we're not able to get that footprint where foam's useful, all we're doing is we're just causing all that oil and all that flammable liquid to be pushed up and out of the tank and spreading out throughout the diked area. And then here again is an example.
example where F500 being used to keep the sidewalls of the tanks cool can prevent that tank from becoming involved. You know, you know, stop it from spreading and keep it to just that one tank. So there's many uses and just an example of how you know, F500 can work hand in hand with other agents and being able to help mitigate and, and to be able to extinguish and control these fires and reduce the hazards to the environment and to the public and, and first responders. Some of the other benefits, let's talk about spill control. Uh, we're always hearing about instances where, you know, we've got, you know, some type of a, maybe a pipeline, gas tanker, um, other things that might uh, have cause spills. And then, you know, there's the need to try to clean up, remediate it. And here we're going to talk about, you know, how if we're using a foam again, you know, you, you have to worry about disturbing that foam blanket. You disturb that foam blanket, you're exposing all of those vapors. If those vapors find an ignition source. Again, we have, you know, a, a problem of a fire explosion. Well, when we sit there and we start looking at encapsulator agents, um, we're able to have a much greater effect. And I'll share a story with you um, here in just a minute. But, uh, you know, when we sit there and we look at being able to encapsulate those fuels, we're, you know, we can reduce that runoff. Um, where with foams, there's that reapplication, um, that reapplication uh, time that we have to do um, in order to maintain a blanket. Where if we've encapsulated it, it no longer needs to have that reapplication. So again, we need to think about the cost and the efficiency. And in industry, when we sit there and start looking, you know, the different types of water, you know, if we've got salt water, you know, if we're close to the you know, salt water source, you know, your encapsulator agents are just as effective using salt water as they are fresh water. In most cases, many of your local regulatory agencies, EPA and so on and so forth, the cleanup is as easy as let it simply evaporate. There's no special cleanup. And unlike your, your foams or your other absorbent materials that do nothing to alter the properties of the fuel, you know, you may be required or have to send those off to a hazardous waste landfill um, where you own it forever. Even though it's in this, that landfill, it's yours. We sit there, we start looking at that spill control. Okay, here is an example of a gasoline spill. And this gets into that 7.7 .7 test, that encapsulation of the flammable fuels, combustible fuels. In this case, it's gasoline. Um, we've sprayed and, and we've treated one half of this spilled area with an encapsulator agent F500, showing that the fire will not spread across. Um, the person on the nozzle is now going to come through. He's going to go and uh, extinguish the fire. He's going to use just a little bit extra just to make sure that he has been able to encapsulate all of the fuel. And now the person with the torch, he's going to light the torch up. And he's going to sit there and he's going to show that that encapsulated gasoline will not burn. And again, there's no blanket. So he's going to stop. He's going to sweep his foot because there's, there's, there's I mean, there's, there's no blanket that you have to worry about disturbing and breaking. That's total encapsulation. That fuel is no longer a hazard. And this is where I mentioned it can just evaporate away. Now, I mentioned earlier that I was going to kind of share a story with you when it comes to your fuel spills. And this is an incident that occurred not too long ago. Um, it happened in the um, state of Kansas at an airport. Um, there was a underground storage tank that was being uh, filled, and unfortunately, the the driver of the truck uh, hooked up to the wrong tank and overfilled um, an above, uh, excuse me, an underground storage tank by about uh, four thousand gallons. Um, the jet fuel was spraying out of the vents, and you know it was going all over. Um, they were worried about an infield pump house that was used to move. Um, the jet fuel from the underground storage tanks to other areas of the airport. Um, not too far from where this occurred was the tower for the airport. And needless to say, um, there was much concern about uh, what was going to take place. Um, the airport, again, being that it's uh, under FAA control, um, used their 
a triple f foam and um, they were saying that their reapplication times were much more um which I, less uh, they needed to apply more often because of the temperatures of the day it was a hot summer day um, so they were reapplying yeah, you know within within five to seven minutes they were having to reapply uh, a blanket to try to suppress and maintain those vapors. A uh, local utility company um, that is a, a big user of F500, um, they've purchased uh, actually mobile, uh, uh, what do you want to say, the, the basically trailers that have monitors as well as nozzles on them, and they make them available to the fire departments in the event of an emergency. So uh, the local fire department um, had requested from the utility company if they could use their trailer. Um, it was called, it was brought to the scene. It holds 500 gallons of F500 concentrate and the area was treated. Those almost 4,000 gallons of jet fuel was treated with 500 gallons of a 3% solution of F500. Um, it sat for 20 minutes. At the end of 20 minutes, the fire department and the airport authorities, they went in and they started testing the pump house, the roof of the pump house, all the areas that were of concern. And at the end of 20 minutes, they could find no LEL. They deemed that site safe for the night. And they all went home. They let all the emergency workers go home. The next morning, they had called and requested that an environmental company come so that they could do a cleanup of the scene. Because they figured, you know, we've got to have some very extensive ground contamination from 4,000 gallons jet fuel. When the environmental contractor got on scene, they brought out their LEL monitors and they started walking around and kind of, you know, putting their hands up in the air and it's like, where was the spill? They did just for, um, you want to say record keeping or just to show that the area wasn't affected. They dug up a couple of areas. They dug up some soil. They tested it. They, they sampled it. Um, they found no evidence of a spill. Um, there was no flammable, no vapors, no VOCs coming off of it. Um, so they did just a couple small areas. So what was thought to be maybe a multi-day cleanup ended up being about three hours. And the environmental team was released from the scene and, and left. So I, I wanted to share that with you when we sit there and we start talking about these spills and the effect in this of F500. Now, now I want to show this video because you heard the story, you know, here we're going to sit there and now we're going to take some, some gasoline. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, spray that gasoline on the, on the ground here. And uh, again, I apologize, my little, won't let, me, won't let me speed this video up for some reason. So we're gonna go through and uh, he's going to spread this, this gasoline on the surface of the ground. And one of the things I want to point out, as you see, you know, he done it. He had done a previous one over here where he's using the kitty litter. Um, so anyway, he sprays oh maybe about a half gallon of, of, of fuel, not much. As you can see, gasoline once you spill it on the ground, it does spread out into a, and it looks like a lot more than it really is. So we're going to take some absorbent material, some clay, some 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 of the um, absorbents that we normally find in like body shops or auto centers garages, fire departments, or tow trucks. He's going to sit there and he's going to coat the surface of the gasoline with the uh, absorbent material. And one of the things I want to point out, again, when we look at these absorbent materials and it gets time to dispose of them, if it's an absorbent material that under pressure will release, okay, those those flammable liquids, those, those, those liquids that are be being absorbed, Okay, it has to go to a hazardous waste landfill. So now what he's gonna do is he's gonna take, like we saw previously with, with the video um, in the gasoline, he's gonna spray half of that area 
with a 3% solution of encapsulator agent, F500. Now he's gonna get his torch. And I like to show this video when I deal with fire departments and other agencies because you know they, they use it and they think, oh, hey, the hazard's gone. It's not. Okay, yeah, we've coated it, we're trying to absorb it, but okay, we haven't done anything to reduce the flammability. And when I sit there and I talk to the fire departments, I start talking about your E10 fuels or your other fuels that have alcohol in it and maybe a combination of gasoline and alcohol. When we sit there and we start looking at, you know, a rainy day, alcohol likes water more than it likes gasoline. So it'll phase separate. It'll be attracted to the uh, moisture more so than the gas. So if you pick up with pads your gasoline, you could still be leaving your ethanol behind. So here now he's going to, just like we saw earlier, um, he's going to treat that area. He's encapsulated the gasoline. Um, he's reduced the hazardous properties um, as far as the flammability aspect of it. But again, you know, what might have been contained and still held within those clay crystals um, may still cause an issue or a problem. Um, as far as being able to, when you get ready and start talking about expo um, disposal. Some of the other issues, when we start looking at the petrochemical company, are our storage tanks. And, you know, here, while it's going to, in this presentation, talk about above ground storage tanks, I mean, we have underground storage tanks, we have tank trucks, we have rail cars, we have ships, barges, you know, anything that transports your flammable liquids, you know, at time, they have to be cleaned. Um, it might be because you're changing from one product to another product. Um, it may be because, you know, after a course of time, um, you know, they just, you know, you need to be inspected and tested. So we need to be able to get in access to be able to do these inspections. In order to do so, we need to be able to clean them. And we're going to talk about the benefits of how an encapsulator agent can be more productive and help you become more productive, how it can reduce the downtime, okay? Uh, and, you know, as far as all the different types of storage tanks, be able to speed this process up. So we look at all the different uh, benefits of the hazards, you know, as far as the benzenes and everything, we're trying to, again, currently reduce the amount of vapors that are being uh, emitted and as far as airborne gases and speed up this degassing de process. And we're gonna show you a couple of case histories. And here's one where you know, we're looking at a 60,000 gallon above ground storage tank. And you know the problem was a severe contamination level, it, basically some water in a tank um, that held diesel. It created, you know, these bugs, uh, which they call the diesel bugs. You can see the, the, the actual chemical name, they're homonoconus resinia. Um, but anyway, you know, here we're calling it, you know, the diesel bug. And you can see pictures of this contamination and it, and it, and it talks in here and in, in, in in, in, in point number, bullet point number two, that you know, if it goes unchecked, okay, if we don't sit there, if we don't clean this up, it can lead to bigger and badder things. For instance, you know, the failure, tank corrosion. Um, it can lead to other types of fungi and yeast and things like that, and reduce or get into your 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 you know your systems when you sit there and start pumping it out and you start sending these fuels to uh, gas stations or areas where trucks and, and other machinery are going to be able to get it, um, you know, it's, it can be an ongoing problem if it doesn't, doesn't get uh, treated and um, get uh, taken care of. So this one talks about, you know, the 60,000 gallon, and they sat there and they went out and uh, they were getting ready to clean it. And first thing you're going, like everybody, we want to make sure that we have, you know, a clean environment and clean area to work in. So, you know, we want to make sure that we have our tailgate meetings and, and do things safely. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're removing all of the residual um, liquids from it as much as possible as far as the, the transfers, the tanks and everything else that might uh, become a problem. 
And then the company, uh, ATBL, uh, begins the tank cleaning process. And they sit there and they talk about how they used to do it versus how they used to. And, and one of the things are is when they sit there and they do these things, they have to bring down the LELs and the VOCs. And when they sat there and they used the encapsulator agent, it shows that, you know, this company was able to get these levels down within one hour. Okay. They were able to then go in and do their cleaning. Um, they were able to do their washing. They were able to, to, to pump all the contaminants and all the you know things into IBC totes. And they were able to take it for an environmental uh, disposal. So when we sit there and start looking and we start thinking about, you know, the cleanliness. Here's pictures from before. Before they started with, you know, the, the fungus and the bacteria and then the after where, you know, they're able to get in there and do their inspection and cleaning and, you know, they've got the zero oil yell and, you know, the tank is, is, is safe. And they sit there and start matching it back to the old way of how they used to do it. And this is a different um, tank. But, you know, they're talking you know, a thousand, um, excuse me, a million liters. So somewhere in the area, about 250,000 gallons. Um, they're using, um, again, nitrogen to be able to um, purge this tank. And they're setting up a torch. So what they're doing is they're using nitrogen. They're pushing the flammable vapors out to a torch where they're flaming them and they're flaring them off. They're saying that this process would take anywhere from four to six hours. But at the end of four to six hours, they would sit there and they would open up a door. They will test and check for the LEL. And if the LELs are still too high, they go back for another two hours. So right now we're somewhere between, you know, six to eight hours of, of trying to just purge this tank of the LELs. Okay, once they've done that, they then have to sit there and they have to allow um, the tank for natural ventilation for two hours and then ventilate with the compressed air without electricity for six hours. So, you know, we're looking at the better part of, you know, a day. We're, we're somewhere in the area of, of eight, four, well, we're almost, we're almost 20 hours into trying to, to basically just get this tank to a point where somebody can make entry and begin the cleaning process. How much did the nitrogen cost? Okay, how much time um, are you spending on man, man hours? So when we sit there and start looking at a similar tank, okay, and we start looking at F500 to 3% being used, can the procedures change instead of having to set up a torch and uh, use nitrogen? They're opening up a door towards the bottom of the tank and they're using a 3% solution of F500 for about 20 minutes. Okay, with, with a jet pattern. Um, they sit there and they'll monitor the LEL. And once they sit there and they start looking the, and verify that the drop has been down to zero, um, they will then begin to start utilizing and, and getting in and doing the cleaning. Because as I was saying, you know, they've used the encapsulator agent to eliminate the vapors in the tank. Then as it goes down into the residual fuels that are on the bottom of the tank, it's encapsulating those fuels, rendering them non-ignitable uh, as well as stopping them from continuing to create additional vapors and off gas. So this process took about 20 minutes versus 20 hours plus, and they used about 60 liters, okay? About 15 gallons of, of concentrate. So it's a huge difference in cost. It's a huge difference in time. Let's think about the safety of our personnel, our, the people doing the work, um, the stress, the fatigue that uh, they would see doing the old way versus the new way. So it makes being able to do and turn these tanks over much faster, much cheaper. Um, so if, if, in the event, you know, you have a tank that, you know, you're switching from gasoline to diesel or from diesel to uh, uh, alcohol or some other type of a liquid, you can turn these tanks over much quicker. Okay, a tanker ship. Okay, again, um, I've been on instances where, you know, there's been failures in piping and, you know, we had some gasoline get into the bilge of, of a ship. Um, again, 
people thinking it's going to take years, a year or months to be able to clean it. And, you know, it was a matter of days. Um, so the differences in, you know, the way we used to look at being able to deal with these types of emergencies to today, using an encapsulator agent is hugely different. And I want to again point out, you know, that fatigue. What's the number one cause of, of our employee injuries? Okay, you know, we sit there and, you know, on a hot day um, where this needs to be done, um, you know, we sit there and start looking at the fatigue, which leads to injuries. Um, and again, more environmentally friendly. Um, instead of that, you know, flaring off and creating those toxic fumes, the black smoke, okay, get nitrogen, having to push it out. Um, how many, you know, thousands of pounds of nitrogen are needed to be able to deal and, and, and be able to uh, clean that and pur purge that tank. So we're dealing with much more environmentally friendly type system and being, being able to clean those. So when we sit there and start looking at equipments and systems that utilize and help to get the, the solutions to the problems, there's many. I mean, we have a two and a half gallon or six liter extinguishers. We have our quick attack mobile units that are, you know, 25, 50, 75, 100 liter portable carts. Um, we have our compressed air systems, mobile response trailers. As I mentioned, with that one utility company, um, they have three and they've got uh, three more that they're ordering um, that hold 500 gallons of concentrate. Um, we offer the piercing rods, you know, the bladder contract, uh, bladder bladder tanks that we saw in um, that one video, as well as water-driven proportioners. Myself, personally, I'm kind of preferencing the water-driven proportioners. I feel they're a little bit more accurate, uh, a little bit more cost-effective uh, as far as its lifetime. Uh, and then you have pump systems. With consulting and training, I, I pointed out you know, that above ground storage tank in China where they were using F500, but yet they were use, utilizing that that nozzle on the side wall of the tank, trying to, to cool it. Um, where encapsulator agents going to do that? So while many people are very familiar with foam, they do not have the same amount of knowledge when it comes to an encapsulator agent. So when we sit there and we start to convert people over, we wanna make sure that we get them trained so that they understand the differences, that they understand all the benefits that using an encapsulator agent is going to bring. Um, you know, when we look at the consulting service, dust hazard analysis, and, you know, the coal handling, fire protection assessments and emergency response planning, you know, it doesn't stop there. Uh, again, lithium ion batteries are a problem and a growing problem. You know, we can help and do training and consulting services when it comes to lithium ion batteries and, and other hazards. You know, combustible dust hazard awareness, you know, some of the courses that we offer. And again, with coal and some of the emergency response. But when it comes to, you know, training with being able to deal if your, your warehouse has a lithium ion powered high lows or um, you got other types of hazards within your facility, by all means, we'd be more than happy to come and do some consulting services, do a site survey, help you out, identify and address the issues that you might have that we can possibly offer solutions to with either a CCS system or sub, sub, sub type of system that can help you to. Um, make your facility even safer. So with that, um, I want to open up the floor. I wanna thank you again for patiently listening. Um, I know for some of you, it could be late at night or early in the morning. Um, so it's not always a convenient time, but uh, again, would like to thank you for uh, spending time to attend and, and hear what uh, we have to say. Um, if as with Graham and others, you know, are some of our distributors, you know, there's additional information that we can help with, additional trainings um, that um, that you would like to see, you know, let us know. Uh, you know we're, we're here to work with you and help you out in any way we can and to get that message out to people as far as the differences between, you know, the current agents that everybody is used to using 
and encapsulator agent. And when it comes to, you know, your lithium ion battery hazards that, you know, copious amounts of water, yeah. well, you know, hey, we can show that, you know, there's something that's better than a copious amounts of water and it's more effective um, and it can stop thermal runaway where water and other agents do not. So by all means, you know, we mentioned those training programs. We mentioned that, you know, people have foam knowledge. They don't have encapsulator knowledge. So please, you know, let us help you help your customers. We're here. Um, so whatever we can do to help you out, you know, let her on. No, by all means, let, you know, go to info at hct.com. I'm sending your request or, or whatever. Um, we're here. To, to provide that assistance to you. And with that, again, thank you um, and enjoy the rest of your day or evening.